Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to our session today on telehealth, cyber security, secure remote patient monitoring ecosystem. My name is Nakia Poisson, and I'm an IT security specialist at the National Institution of Standards and T Technology. I am the uh, principal investigator for the healthcare sector at the uh, National Cyber Security Center of Excellence. Uh, the the uh, National Cyber Security Center of Excellence in CCOE, a part of the National Institution of Standards and Technology, NIST, is a collaborative hub where industry organizations, government agencies, and, and academic institutions come together to address businesses' most pressing cyber security issues. The N CCOE applies cyber security standards and best practices to develop a easily adaptable example cyber security solutions. Traditionally, patient monitoring systems have been de deployed in control environments, such as healthcare facilities. Increasingly, healthcare Delivery or organizations, HDOs, are relying on telehealth, remote patient monitoring, RPM capabilities so that they can care for patients at home. The NCCOE worked with 10 industry co collaborators and built an example solution with a reference architecture to demonstrate how organizations can implement their security and privacy controls to enhance the resiliency of their telehealth services. Now, I'll let the panel introduce themselves. I'll pass it over to Axel to introduce himself. Thanks, Akia, and uh, yes, hi, my name is Axel Worth. I'm the Chief Security Strategist um, for Metcrypt, the San Diego-based cybersecurity company with focus on the medical device industry. Um, this is actually my, my third NCCOE healthcare project uh, I've been participating in. Um, this time my role was as a cybersecurity advisor and, and subject matter expert and has once again been a great experience uh, working with the, the team at NCCOE and, and, and producing this hopefully uh, beneficial outcome to, to the larger community. Thank you, Axel. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Wake, Executive Director for the Office of Information Security at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. In that capacity, I serve as the institution's Information Security Officer. UMMC is one of only two telehealth centers of excellence in the United States. Sue? Thank you, Steve. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Su Wan, and I'm a, a principal cybersecurity engineer and MITER, a non-profit -for -profit company and provides research and uh, support to federal agencies. For this project, I serve as a technical lead and uh, for the NCCOE healthcare team. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're going to start with discussing the project motivation and the scope of, of the work. Sue, let's start with you. What motivated the NCCOE team to take on this topic? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. And in the late uh, 2018, as an effort to identify the pipeline projects, uh, the, we did some research and uh, decided on to expand our work into the telehealth space. I would say we have three major motivations for the NCCOE healthcare team to take on this topic. First, our community of interest and the stakeholder from the industry express the interests and the needs of the cybersecurity guidance in the telehealth space. And secondly, our NCCOE healthcare team also had that desire to expand our work uh, into uh, the 
er other areas uh, in the healthcare landscape. As at that time, we already uh, worked with industry collaborators and uh, published three cybersecurity guidance, uh, which were all focused on the HDO enterprise environment. And the third motivation will be, and uh, we realized uh, that the increased the security and the privacy concerns in the connected house and beyond the uh, HDO enterprise environment. So once we decide on working in the in, uh, telehealth space, we then scope down uh, this project down to, to focus on the remote patient monitoring RPM ecosystem. And I work across three domains, the patient home, a telehealth platform provider, and HDO. Thanks, Sue. Steve, uh, what are some of the challenges that you have seen in the industry that made it important for uh, CCOE to take on this topic? Uh, well, Nakia, in uh, Mississippi, uh, residents in 53 of the state's 82 counties, uh, they must drive more than 40 minutes to see a specialist. That challenge is not unique to our state. When we created the Delta Diabetic Network in 2014, we saved the initial 100 participants in that trial more than 9,454 miles in driving to specialists in Jackson, Mississippi, or Memphis. And not a single participant was hospitalized or visited an emergency room due to complications of their diabetes, saving payers more than $300,000. Thanks, Steve. Aksu, what are your thoughts? Yes, um, as Steve was pointing out, um, in telehealth is, is a relative recent evolution in care delivery, and it addresses multiple challenges, including improving access to care, reducing the cost of care, um, but also addressing uh, the need to care for an increasingly aging population, the baby boomers that are heading for you know, retirement age and an age of more chronic diseases. Um, it is also, in many cases, uh, preferred by the patients. Uh, they like to receive care at home rather than in the hospital. They like to avoid the travel, as Steve was pointing out, rather than um, you know, sitting in traffic. Uh, and, and, and certainly the recent pandemic has ac accelerated these trends. Um, some even say by more than a decade. And I'm sure that most of these changes to towards a um, telehealth and remote care delivery program um, you know, are here to stay. They will be with us for the future. Thanks, Aksu. Aksu, as you and Steve uh, talk about some of the challenges in telehealth services, it will be great to hear how you and your organization uh, benefit from working with this topic. And still, uh, and see, feel free to jump uh, to jump right in after Axel. So from, from my perspective and my organization's perspective, um, you know, clearly any collaboration across stakeholders um, and, and, and with other subject matter experts is beneficial. Uh, it provides a reality check. Um, it provides a way to, to think about and implement security um, in, in the real world context and in the practical clinical environment, rather than thinking about and dealing with security more in the abstract. For us, uh, it was just an opportunity to learn other ways on how to secure an RPM uh, environment uh, where proprietary devices are not available or practical. Uh, our practice has been to use proprietary, secure proprietary, proprietary devices uh, in, the, in the past. And then also to learning how to manage voice assistance, which is a new challenge from a security perspective in the home and, and other video uh, aspects, and then how to account for them when putting together such an architecture. And then we learned to, how to account for uh, all of the variables and how to mitigate the security risks they pose by structuring it in, um, in various, various stages or various environments and how, how we would manage the remote patient monitoring. Great. Um, to follow on to that, 
I ask you, what benefits can panel guests and, and organizations take away from this work? So what we're going to talk about in, in this session and, and what the larger project was about is, is really how to um, implement and, and effectively realize an RPM system um, that, that leverage the existing infrastructure um, that, that is in place, leverages existing technologies and leverages existing uh, approaches to cybersecurity to again, you know, implement and, and realize uh, an RPM based uh, care delivery model. So it uh, exposes the need and the business challenge within the uh, HDO industry. Remote patient monitoring is, is growing exponentially. And, and as Axel said previously, it's, it's pretty much the expectation for our patients right now. And from an HDO perspective, it also helps us in uh, infection control because we want uh, our patients back in the home as, as quickly as possible. And, you know, the other thing for us and, and what attracted us is this wasn't a vendor promotion, but it's rather a template for establishing a secure remote patient monitoring environment while still engaging the outside resources that you at your organization are most comfortable with. Great. Uh, Steve, in the context of technology, how does technology organization view the healthcare industry? Well, at, at UMMC, we're, we're all in accord. Uh, we have a security council that meets monthly and includes members from hospital leadership, frontline healthcare workers, students, as we're also responsible for the seven schools on our campus, legal compliance and procurement. Um, you cannot wait for this type of engagement. You must command it. And, and it should be easy, really, in today's world, because uh, remote patient monitoring and telehealth are necessary business lines, as is the security and privacy protections of our patients. Great. Thanks. Axel? Yeah, so, so maybe to, to add to that um, thought, and that is that, you know, I think healthcare is still challenged with uh, cybersecurity. Um, for example, if you look at, at the um, breaches reported to Health and Human Services, um, we saw a 26% increase in reported breaches in 2020. Um, and, and certainly there are many reasons for healthcare challenges, right? One is the complexity of health technology, um, the, the slim profit margins, which make it difficult to invest in security, um, the, the lack of healthcare specific frameworks and best practices uh, to implement security. And, and we believe that um, your projects like this NCCE project, project um, are a good step that, that help the industry uh, to improve their security posture or as in the case of remote patient monitoring, um, adopt new technology without taking on undue security risks. Thank you both. As earlier stated in the, uh, in, in the beginning of today's session, in CCOE applies NIST standards and best practices to develop easily adaptable example cybersecurity solutions. And for this project, we also looked at potential privacy risks that may occur when de deploying RPM devices in patients' home. And provided possible solutions to mitigate those risks. So Apsu, uh, how did NIST standards, uh, such as the NIST uh, cyber security framework and the NIST privacy framework benefit this project? So the NIST cyber security framework has been with us for a number of years and it has very quickly established itself as um, as a de facto standard, actually both nationally as well as internationally on uh, good security practices and how to communicate around security. Right? So as a, as a minimum, I think any organization that looks at implementing a new technology, new program, uh, new approach to security should look at the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework as, as, as a standard that should be met and implemented. Um, the NIST 
privacy framework, which is actually more recent, um, is similar being adopted across industries. And I think it's quite meaningful to an industry like healthcare that has um, you know, very strict privacy regulations um, to comply with. And, um, and adopting these kind of standard approaches, uh, I think makes, makes it easier to not only implement um, a good approach to security, but also maintain that approach over time. Steve, what are your thoughts? So um, I'll echo what uh, Axel just said, um, and, and also say that uh, th this project, this initiative helped emphasize the, the need to ensure remote patient monitoring was considered um, so that we do meet the standard established by the HIPAA Safe Harbor Law, which was signed January 5th of this year. Great, thank you both. Uh, Axu, what could happen if a RPM ecosystem is a, is a compromise? So, I mean, looking at, at the slide that is actually up on the screen right now, um, certainly the, the remote patient monitoring ecosystem is quite complex as it reaches from the patient's home over a typically cloud-based service provider across a public network and then to the healthcare provider. And, and any compromise at any point in this uh, data flow uh, can lead to unintended uh, privacy or security compromise, but can also have uh, safety implications um, as compromised patient data could compromise um, the, the safety of a patient. And therefore, um, you know, the system's ability to maintain confidentiality and integrity and availability of sensitive data across the entire structure is, is paramount and is critic, critical to implement. Great. Thank you. Uh, Steve, what are your thoughts? So um, <clears throat> if there was a, an incident, it would initiate uh, an incident response on our end in which we would determine if it's an isolated instance to a specific home or environment, or if it was uh, more broadly to that initiative, that remote patient monitoring initiative, or if our entire ecosystem needs to be revised to ensure the privacy protections uh, of all our RPM patients. So uh, all three would be considered and then we would mitigate and resolve uh, based on our findings. Great, thank you. Uh, Sue, could you briefly describe how this project evaluated the risk to the RPM? <laughs> ecosystem and what approach does this project use to tack it, uh, tackle that challenge that uh, you all have been discussing so far? Sure, certainly. Thank you, uh, Nakia. So just like any uh, NCCOE projects, the securing RPM ecosystem project will use the risk-based approach. And what we do, did is that we develop a control framework focused on the use of three core NIST frameworks, uh, the, the risk management framework, the cybersecurity framework, and the privacy framework. Uh, as far as the risk assessment goes, when we thought about this uh, RPM distributed architecture, uh, we decided to take a threat-centric approach in understanding and mitigating uh, those risks. So as, as we all know, the risk uh, is made up with, uh, of two components, the threats and the vulnerabilities. So essentially the uh, threat centric approach that means is we try to disrupt uh, the threats. For this uh, RPM project, we conduct a generic threat modeling exercise. Uh, we described a generic uh, threat modeling uh, uh, the, the methodology for exam the threats in the system. And we go through and exam those components uh, that are just deployed at the patient home as a representative to showing how to conduct a threat modeling. 
when we select controls and uh, once we figure out what's, uh, you know, what's vulnerable and when we select control uh, for this RPM practice guide, we really select those controls can limit or prevent the threat action. Remember we said it's threat-centric uh, threat, uh, approach, right? And uh, we try to focus on the RPM context and uh, we would like to assume that uh, the healthcare organization have implemented or will implement a broader set of control that extended beyond the scope of telehealth RPM. One important thing we really need to point out is the uh, any organization when they deploy a RPM solution, they could use this example solution uh, as the for their implementation. Um, however, and they once you, you can recognize is the this is the one of the many implementation and the architecture. Um, nothing can beats the organization really, they need to uh, perform their own risk assessment and they implement the control based on their own uh, risk posture. Thank you, Sue. Hak Sue, um, it would be great if you, you can share your uh, thoughts as well. Sure, I think one thing we need to realize is that, that implementing good security is not easy. Uh, security is actually quite hard, especially in light of, of real life and practical constraints and, and limitations we, we need to live with. And uh, I think as Sue was referencing, the NIST cybersecurity framework, as well as the uh, NIST privacy framework, are good starting points for any type of organization, uh, doesn't matter whether they're large, medium or small, to define their reference model and their path towards a more secure infrastructure. And, and, and these frameworks are not intended to compete with existing regulations, like for example, um, HIPAA or CCPA or other regulations that may exist locally. Um, they are more intended to help with the, actually uh, the implementation of the re regulations and, and um, they can be used as a tool to demonstrate how the requirements of, for example, the HIPAA privacy and security rules are being met through um, through the choice of the right framework. Great. Uh, back to you, Stu. What is the practical solution that HDOs can implement to mitigate the risk and increase cyber security within the telehealth RPM ecosystem? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. And so it comes back to, to our product, work product, right? The uh, cybersecurity guidance. And uh, let me share some of the, the building and design principles at NCCOE. Whenever we design and building a cybersecurity solution, and uh, we, we follow certain uh, principles, uh, such as and our uh, solution will be standard-based, modularized, useful and repeatable. And we're also using the commercial available technology. So whatever we implement and uh, the HDO can really, and uh, they'll be able to find the existing technology already there, uh, what we used. The other thing is a key thing is the, uh, all our work are open and transparent to the public and uh, everybody can have access to it. Then let's come back, talk about uh, specifically this RPM uh, practice guide. This guide and the way uh, defined in uh, three volumes. You can think of those uh, volumes as address. We can say why and what and how of this project respectively. Volume A. The volume A is a executive summary and it is a high level document for those decision makers to understand the challenging and uh, that a enterprise facing in the secure a RPM ecosystem. So if volume A can also have them to be aware of this example solution and the build at NCCOE and the benefits of adopting, uh, adopting those uh, example uh, solutions into their organizations. 
Then let's talk about the volume B. The volume B is uh, describes those risk assessment approach that we used during the course of this project. And uh, we, uh, the reader will find that the, the tables and uh, we put together cross map the controls and we select in a number of industry standards as well as how they align with the NIST frameworks, including the cybersecurity framework and the privacy framework. And we also uh, showing in those table to see how this align with the HIPAA security rule. You can see that's a one place and the cross map uh, multiple standards and it really depends on your background. You can always find something and uh, in common. And when we map them back to the cybersecurity framework, as Axel said, and that's a way for us to communicate and uh, talking to, you know, app compare Apple to Apple. The technology, how can we use that, right? The technology and the security professionals can really take the advantage of the volume B and on what we did and why we did in terms of the risk assessment approach, the reference architecture, and the security characteristics of this RPM guide. They can then take the steps and to, do, to doing what we did to better understand the risk that might be involved in their environment and how they might be able to dis, uh, deploy controls to better safeguard their overall ecosystem. So the last part of the uh, RPM uh, practice guide, I, I say last part, I, I put a quote and you might hear something more. And it's our volume C. The volume C is really uh, the engineer book. And uh, it's we document those procedures and the steps on how our lab environment was constructed. Uh, we work with technology partnership to bring their uh, you know, technology based on our architecture design, put them into uh, build them and test them, making sure that our solution works and uh, produce the, the cybersecurity capability as what we intend to do. So all those uh, steps of the deployment and configuration are documented in the volume C. And uh, so the uh, IT and the security professional can use this volume C to uh, replicate the part or whole example solution what we build into the lab. Great. Uh, Steve, what are your thoughts? So my, my first recommendation is to uh, go to school on the three volumes uh, Sue just detailed to create a volume four. Um, and the volume four would be specific to the patients and their caregivers. So in plain and simple language, there's a clear understanding of the need for uh, and how to protect their own privacy. And so in a quick example I'll give is when we established the Delta Diabetic Network, um, each of the participants was given a proprietary tablet and the questions that they had to answer daily were at a fifth grade rate reading level. And if that was too much to manage for the patient or their caregiver. It was, there was also an audio portion. So remember your patient when you're implementing these and provide them the security protocols in, in a very uh, easy to understand manner and emphasize why it's important. Great, thank you. Uh both, that was a very great point. Aksu, what role does uh, industry play in developing solutions to these cyber security challenges? As, as you said initially, the goal of these NCCV projects is really to, to demonstrate a, a practical and implementable solution to securing uh, a given infrastructure, in this case, remote patient monitoring. And uh, the industry representatives, and, and you see the logos here on the slide, um, they provided um, the, the hardware and software as well as the expertise needed um, to, to build these model implementations. And that includes um, the, the clinical technology, 
and the infrastructure technology, but also the security solutions that, that were applied in these use cases. Steve? So industry must be cognizant of the exponential growth of RPM and modify its cybersecurity review practices pre and post market, much like the FDA has begun to do following the OIG audit in the fall of 2018. Industry must recognize that RFPs, requests for proposals, will require detailed security practices as part of the bid proposal. We must also recognize that the use of FHIR, fast healthcare interoperability resources, and our patients' growing reliance on mobile apps has made multi-factor authentication a necessity. Steve, so, so I'm gonna come back to you. Uh, how can this project apply to organizations that utilize uh, cloud-based services or need to secure access uh, assets uh, across a wide geographic uh, region? So the model implementation included a cloud component for data hosting and routing. And, and cloud relevant security considerations were included in the project analysis and implementation based upon that. And so HDOs need to provide access to the cloud where broadband is unavailable, expensive or unreliable. What is the most secure and economical solution? And in some cases that may be a MiFi device, uh, depending on how rural uh, your patients are. But again, that doesn't take away from the structure that we've created here and uh, we've accounted for in, in the RPM solutions that we've provided. Great, thank you. Aksu, uh, can you please uh, share your thoughts? Uh, yeah, sure. Just to add to Steve's point, right? in, in, in that sense, this project can be used as a reference model for providing and implementing security uh, in an age of, of the disappearing traditional enterprise security perimeter. Uh, whether it's remote care or any other scenario, uh, we need to realize that, that users, devices, and data are moving out of the enterprise and uh, we need to adopt a new approach to security so that we can assure continued uh, protection of, of um, you know, the critical data that is now uh, out there in a much broader ecosystem than it was before. Great. Uh, thank you both. Uh, so we were planning to do, uh, to work on this project prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has definitely uh, accelerated our work. Uh, Steve, how has the COVID-19 pandemic uh, alter the use of telehealth services throughout 2020 and beyond. Uh, well, we have a similar uh, telehealth uh, security and privacy concerns or more. And we have a, a few minutes. So uh, if you, you all both, uh, if Steve, you can like just talk for one minute, that'd be great. And then we'll move over uh, to Axel. Sure. So again, the, the pandemic accelerated the need for RPM and the process of RPM to reduce patient exposure, manage caseloads, free hospital capacity, and enable compliance with lockdown re recommendations. So, um, you know, patients prefer, because of this, patients have become accustomed to it. They prefer to wait in the comfort, privacy, and security of their own home rather than an environment with uh, other people who are sick. So again, we have to emphasize uh, and, and educate them as well as make sure that we have the process in place um, in our own organizations. Great, thank you. Uh, Aksu? Yeah, just maybe to add a few thoughts to that. Um, I mean, obviously we will continue to see um, security and privacy concerns uh, in increase, right? Security because hackers are getting more sophisticated uh, privacy because more and more regulations and laws are being put into place to protect citizens' uh, data. And uh, um, the, the guidance that was developed by N NCC for the remote patient monitoring case uh, is a useful model, I think, 
to help organizations to adopt uh, and implement a forward-looking security strategy, uh, not only for the RPM program, but also um, uh, beyond as we certainly are facing um, an interesting future between increasing uh, cyber threats and, and increasing need to move care out of the hospital. Great, thank you. Uh, before we get uh, ready to conclude, Steve, how can we best reach HCOs to share this cyber security guidance and reference architecture? So create awareness by sharing with peers at conferences and in webinars. It's rare that security is not an agenda item or a hallway discussion or both at a cybersecurity event. Don't be afraid to speak up and don't be afraid to share if someone reaches out to you. Remember, we're all in this together and we need each other. And this was the first step. Thank you. Axel? Yeah, maybe a closing comment here. Looking back, this has been a, a great and very beneficial project uh, for us to participate in. And uh, I hope it also was useful for the general audience, um, you know, listening to this um, a presentation here, but also then have the ability to access the uh, practice guides. Um, in, in hindsight, it was certainly a timely project uh, considering the changes that COVID forced on us. And uh, you know, telehealth and, and remote care are here to stay. They're not gonna go away once we are through the pandemic. And uh, we need to make sure that whatever we build and whatever we deliver to our patients um, is gonna be uh, safe and secure and as a model that uh, can be uh, trusted by all participants, especially the patients. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, cyber adversaries are becoming more targeted, they're becoming better in their craft, and they're looking, um, you know, for more opportunity um, to steal data, to, to ransom money, uh, to develop their attack strategies. And looking at some of the statistics that are out there, um, we are not getting ahead of them, right? We are still seeing breaches grow. We see more and more attacks and we need to uh, double up our efforts and reverse the tide um, because the longer we hesitate, the more difficult it will be to catch up. Great. Uh, thank you to all the panelists today. Uh, I hope, uh, uh, well, we hope that our uh, panel discussion provided a, 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 a great overview and, um, and an insight for our uh, collaborative effort in securing our PM ecosystem. We are happy to let you know that we just released the second draft of the NIST Cyber Security Practice Guide Special Publication SP18-30 in early May. It is uh, currently available for public comment. So what's next? We would like to offer some action items based on the time frame as suggested by the RSA uh, conference. So next week, we ask that you all download, review, and participate in our public comment period for the second draft of the practice guide. In the first three months, we ask that you uh, we refer to the volume B of the guide to conduct a risk assessment in your own environment. Within six months, the next step is to adopt some of the reference architecture and security capabilities from the guide to en enhance your overall security postures. Before we end this uh, session, we are happy to answer any questions uh, any uh, questions that you might have. And you can also follow up with us uh, with your feedback and here's our contact uh, information. Thank you uh, very much for attending our uh, session and thank you to the panelists uh, for this very insightful uh, conversation.